Well, the title of this message, John, is God Says Build. Let's say together, God Says Build. <clears throat> uh, our text is from the book of Ezra, and um, we are th- chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Book of Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. So, so it's coming up on PowerPoint. <clears throat> Let's read together after three. Three. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up. Stop there. Let's repeat that again. The Lord stirred up. Stop there. Let's repeat again. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Israel. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place, with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Stop there. Everyone whose spirit God had one more time to go up to I think we can do verse 7 as well. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. God had promised Israel that if they obeyed him, they would prosper in every way within their promised land. But if they didn't obey him, he would uh, lift his protection off them and other nations would harass them. But if they repented of not being obedient to God uh, and turned, then God would protect them again. But if they were persistent in their sinful behavior, they would be expelled from the promised land and they would be scattered among the nations, the known nations. However, if whilst in those nations they repented and said to God, I'm so- we're sorry, we got it wrong, we want to come back to you, then God would hear them and bring them back to their promised land. So Israel started well. Everything was going well. Then they had civil war and the nation split into two. North Israel, southern Israel, or uh, which came known as Judah. The capital of northern Israel became Samaria and the capital of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. Now, after a period of time, Northern Israel was conquered by uh, an Assyrian king, and Assyria was the superpower of that day. 
and the Jews were taken out of northern Israel and they were scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire. That's what, the, that's what they did. And then a bit later on, southern uh, Israel, Judah as it were, was eventually conquered by, the super, by a superpower which was named Babylon. Exactly. And Jews were taken to Babylon, which is the, uh, today is modern Iraq. Now, after some time had passed, another empire arose. And that empire was the Persians, which is modern-day Iran. And they conquered the Babylonians, i.e. modern-day Iraq. And they had a king. And this king was called Cyrus. Say Cyrus. Cyrus. And Cyrus said that he said to, to his people in his empire, he said to them, he said, I have been instructed by God to build a house in Jerusalem for him. He said, whoever is Jewish and wants to build, go and build. Now this was interesting because it fulfilled the prophetic word that Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah gave when he said that after, seven, after the Israelites been in exile for 70 years, and they were in ex ex exile for 70 years because they were being punished and disciplined by God for idolatry, immorality, and for not let it, keeping the sabbatical years. Now, how many of you know what the sabbatical years are? are? All right, Crispin. Every seven years yeah. and every 50 years for Jubilee. What happened then? You would leave, if you were a farmer or anything, you'd leave your fields go fallow for a year. Okay, great. You'd what, let them rest. So what much. else? Yeah, things were returned after seven debts years. Debts were you released from your debts. So every seven years, God commanded that the land was to lie fallow. It was to rest. You couldn't sow it and you couldn't reap it. It had to rest. Listen, if we had that sort of understanding now, I wonder whether we would be talking about global warning. If we were beginning to just let, a, uh, let a r God's rhythm permeate this wonderful world, that instead of exhausting the earth and exhausting the fuel that God has given... Do you know what? I was thinking about this. I digress a minute, but come with me. I was thinking about this. You know, this, you know we, we want to shut down the coal and we want to shut down the oil and all the rest of it. But I have a problem with that because it's like God has given us those things to enable us to keep warm, to enable us to operate, etc. The problem is not the coal. The problem is not the oil. It's the problem is how we use the coal and how we use the oil. We're so greedy with, what, with, with the resources of heaven uh, that, that God has given us, the resources in the earth, that we stretch things in a way that they should not be stretched and then things start crumbling and falling. If we let the land rest, regularly and for that you know that it would rejuvenate it you know itself the balance would be um but would be uh gained again but for that to happen we have to stop being greedy and the problem is we don't like stop to stop being greedy anyway this is the israelite this is what the israelites fell into. Human nature is the same, even if it's thousands of years ago to today. It's still the same. And God says, enough is enough. You will not listen. So into exile you go. But Jeremiah also prophesied and said, God will raise up a king. And you'll be there for 70 years. And, God, and, but, and then God will raise up a king. And his name is Cyrus. All right? This is what was prophesied. And, um, and he will get sent, gather you and release you back to, to your promised land. Now the interesting thing is not only Jeremiah prophesied this, but there was also a, a prophet called Isaiah prophesied this. And he spoke about Cyrus and how God would use him. Now listen to this. A hundred and fifty years before Cyrus was born. 
All right? He, he named him under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he declared what he would do 150 years before he was born. So, we're there now. It's time. And uh, the return of the Israelites to the promised land happened in three stages. I think that there were more, there, there were other stages, but the Bible talks about three stages, um, significant stages. And I think because the Bible highlights these three groups, that means that it was, they must have been very significant. The first group was led by a guy called Zerubbabel. Say that with me, Zerubbabel. Oh. The second group was led by a guy called Ezra. And the third group was led by Nehemiah. Now, there were two prophets in, around at the time of Zerubbabel. And uh, one was called Haggai and one was called Zechariah. Now, this is really important for, you, for us to get our heads around. Prophets speak truth to power to help power. Prophets, let's say that together, speak truth to power to help power. We need to understand that. Prophets don't speak because they want to elevate their ministry. Prophets don't preach, speak because they want to criticize and moan and groan and, 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 and lift the, and elevate themselves as the ones who, who got it all together. And if you look to them and you listen to them and you let them be your leader, then everything's going to be all right. Prophets don't do that. Prophets speak truth to power to help power. And so Haggai and Zechariah helped Zerubbabel. And, and so, why am I putting all this out here? Because we're now entering, I believe, into a new stage as a church. I remember speaking to Amanda Turner um, in the pandemic, and, um, and we were talking about how church will ch can change or will change or does God want church to change uh, you know and so on and and we were talking I think about pe people making decisions in the pandemic and and as we were talking one of the things that uh, we explored is what it is to be in a liminal space in a place in other words of transition and we're very much felt that we as uh, you know that God's church in the pandemic was in a was in a liminal space a place of transition it wasn't a time to change direction it wasn't a time to it, to embrace new um, new ways of doing things which will be established in the foundation of the of the church um, you know for decades to come but it was it was a uh, a time of transition, and when you're in a time of transition, it's rocky, isn't it? It's the ground moves, you know. It's like taking your gear stick in your car and, 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 and putting it into the, 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 the middle zone where it's all wobbly and so on before you engage into gear one or two or three or four or six or ten if you've got uh, some fancy car. But it's, 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 in that place, you don't make life-changing decisions it's a but what you do do is you do plant yourself you do stand firm you do do what you know is right to do you hold the ground until the ground gets steady so you can move forward say hold the ground you hold the ground you hold the ground you hold the ground and you wait for everything, for the, for the storms to pass. You wait for the wind to stop blowing. You wait, you wait for things to steady down so that you can begin to, uh, um, you know, understand what's happening and then move forward. The, the liminal space is, a, is very important. It's ve it prepares you for the change that is to come. It, pre it, it, it prepares you for the direction that it is to come. It's, it's a, it's, the liminal space is not an inactive place. It's not a passive place. It's a place where a lot is going on, but where you have to stand 
and hold your ground as, as the stuff goes on in you, in your mind, and in your understanding. And then when everything, the ground gets firm, then you can see the direction you need to go. Are you hearing me? And I believe that we are, coming, we are now moving forward. And over the time since we you know, had the, uh, the pandemic and we can take off masks and, and shut windows and all that sort of stuff, we, were begin, we began to do things that would help us to gather, help us to come back together. We got a comedian in and we had a great night. How many of you enjoyed that night? Yeah, it was a great night. And, um, and, and, and we, we ate together and we, we went to the beach together and we had picnics together and, we, and then we started doing stuff in this building building that we, were, we, we, we once did and couldn't do anymore because of the pandemic. We started doing those things. And we kind of, what we're doing there is re-establishing ourselves, all right? We were kind of, um, you know, being able to, taking up the stuff that we had to put down, we were beginning to take it up again, which was vitally important. We made sure that this building, before that, we made sure that this building remained open. And, um, and following the regulations and the, and the rules and the advice as best as we could, we, we, we decided not to make it easy for ourselves and stay in our homes and, uh, and, and just do it and try and worship from our homes. And so we felt that that wouldn't help us to hold the ground. And so we made sure that the doors were open and that, and that everything was uh, administrated uh, wisely and correctly so we could gather and then we moved on to doing things that we couldn't do um, in that time. And so, and so holding ground, holding ground, then filling the ground, holding it, then filling it, holding it, then filling it, holding it, then filling it. And now I believe we're moving forward. So I believe God is inviting us to join him in building the house of Shekinah. All right. Some of you are going to immediately think, oh, well, yes, the, br the bride of Christ, the, the church in the area. No, that's not what I said. What I said is God, I believe, is calling us to join him in building the house of Shekinah. And over the, the, the months to come, we shall hopefully allow Jesus by the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah and Esther as well to bring encouragement and inspiration to help us to be co-laborers in with him as he builds Shekinah and extends his kingdom in West Cornwall. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you ready to look at our text? Here we go. There is a word that comes up twice in our text that when I was preparing, it, it caught my atten attention and really excited me. And the Holy Spirit say, said, land on that. And that the word is still. Let's say that together, stir, all right. In Hebrew, it, the, it means, in Hebrew, it means this, to awake. Let's say that again, to awake, literally or figuratively, all right. So it doesn't just apply to those of you who fall asleep when the sermon is going out, okay, all right. Though, to, to all of us, to awake, literally or figuratively, to open one's eyes, right? To open one's eyes. To see so that you can see where you've not seen before. So you can hear where you've not heard before. So you can understand that which seems to have eluded your understanding in the past. It means to arouse oneself to passivity. No, to activity. It means to get active, to get ready, to arouse oneself to activity. 
But the t- our text doesn't quite say that, does it? Our text says, the Lord stirred them up. They, it was, they didn't stir themselves up, but it was the Lord who stirred them up. Say, the Lord will stir me up. So the first thing I want to look at is the stirring of Cyrus. The stirring of Cyrus. Let's read from verses 1 to 4 of Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Wow. Now, again, let's understand, look at Cyrus. Let's look at a little bit more about, of, uh, regarding Cyrus before I really begin to unpack this first point. Isaiah 45 verses 1 to 7. This is what Isaiah spoke about um, Cyrus. Isaiah 45, 1 to 7. Let's read together after 3. 3. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus. Remember, this is 150 years before Cyrus was born. Okay? Whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him. The gates may not be closed. I will go before you, level the exalted places. I'll break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by name for the sake, say that with me, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I will call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. And so what we have here, for the sake of his people, For the sake of his people, God raises up a king to be a blessing to them. A king who will empower them. A king who will release them from their captivity and will give them all that they need all the silver, all the gold, all the wealth that they need to be established once again in their promised land. Cyrus was born for that purpose. Hear me. Cyrus was born for that purpose. That is what his life was all about. That is why he was made king of of this massive empire, this influential empire, to serve the purposes of God, to serve God's people. Are you hearing me? And so Cyrus, you know, he says, God comes into the revelation of what his life is about. When does he come into that revelation? When the Holy Spirit stirs him up 
The Holy Spirit, he doesn't come into it by sitting there thinking, what is my life about? Where am I going? Da, 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 da. He was a busy man. He, he, he ruled a massive empire. But I reckon that somehow in his heart that he had a sense that his life, there was more to his life than that. That he hadn't yet fulfilled his, his destiny. I remember hearing a story of a black man who, was, uh, who, who had the sense that God had called him to the nations. And, um, and, he, and he did his job and he brought up his family and he looked after his grandchildren and all the rest of it. And still there was something missing in his life. And then when he got into his 90s marina, he suddenly got an opportunity to travel. And he began to travel from one nation to another nation, just servicing, serving the purposes of God. And he said to us all, he said, now in my 90s, I'm doing what I was made to do. Now in my 90s, the vision is being fulfilled. Now in my 90s, I have a sense of uh, fulfillment because I'm doing that which was in God laid in my heart. I want to say to you, I think Cyrus was just like that as well. And that here he was, educated, military strategist, you know, um, educated to a high standard, and his empire is expanding, and it's successful, and, and, but still, there was something, not, something missing, but he didn't do, know what it was. And then one day, God stirred him up, stirred him up, stirred, and he was beginning to hear something that he couldn't hear before. He saw something that he couldn't see before. He was awoken to something that he didn't know that he had to be awakened to before. And suddenly he saw that his job was to actually send all the Jewish people back to the, to the promised land. And he was not only to send them back, but he was to charge them to build the house of the Lord. And not only was he to charge them to build the house of the Lord, he was to release finance to them to build the house of the Lord. And so out of the treasury, he released the royal treasury. <laughs> the treasury of the empire. Okay, the treasury of the empire that didn't like the Jews, that didn't like Israel, that looked down upon them, who saw them as nothing, a weak and conquered people. It was this treasury, this treasury of this empire. He was to use their money to establish the Jews and build the house of the Lord in the promised land. Not only was he taking money out of his treasury, but he was, he, he as king could command other people to be generous. And he, and he commanded people who were around the Jews to give to them silver and gold so that they may go and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, you know, again. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal that the people who were the enemy of the Jews actually made way for them when God stirred them up. When God stirred them up. I just love this, 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 you know, this, this thing here. The men of his place with silver and gold, with goods, with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. He commanded that there be an abundance given so that these people could build the house of the Lord in, in Jerusalem. And all that were around about them, all that were around about them, all that were around the people, listen, all that were around wherever the Jews were scattered within the Persian Empire were to help them. They had no choice in it. They were commanded to do it. They had to help the people of God 
build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, in the temple. I want us to understand this. That God is saying that this is a time to build now. It's, there's, a time, there's, a time, there's a time to build. To build um, in a way that we've never build, built before. And that he has prepared us to build like we've never built before. We as a people have wandered around. We've been a bit nomadic. We've been sojourners, if you like. People who stay in, uh, have temporary residence um, in, uh, in, in, in the place where they abide. How many of you remember when we used to meet at Humphrey Davy School? How many of you remember when we used to meet at John Daniel Centre? How many of you remember when we used to meet in Morrow Gardens? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, how many of you remember when we went into homes? Yeah, yeah all right. I mean, we were, all, we were all over the place. How many of you remember when we were at Mount's Bay School? We were moving, 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 moving. And what, sorry? St. Thomas's. Thomas's. The Anglican Mission Church. YMCA. YMCA. Yeah. Nigel built a cupboard and trapped himself in it because he wanted to stay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we moved, girl. We moved, we moved, we moved, we moved around. And then God brought us to this place, right? This place that I didn't want to be at because it was not disabled friendly. But when we came here, how long have we been here now, Lib? Since 2005, we've been here. In 2005, we took, up, took on the lease of this, or the rent, I think, at the time, of this, uh, of this hall, top section. And it was very, and I didn't want to come here. And, um, but uh, Crispian and, and another trustee at the time said, Charles, we really need to look at this. Lease will have our own space. And so we came, and it seemed right to have it, and, 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 and we did. And then we began to look at the history of this place. Now, I'm just talking, when I talk about this place now, I'm just talking about this section, this top floor and the kitchen, nothing else, all right? Because downstairs was a video shop. And I began to look at the history of this place, and in the 50s, the Elam Pentecostal Church used to use this hall. They didn't have downstairs, they just used this hall. I have a picture at home in my desk of, of, a, of a group of Pentecostal um, uh, you know, believers and a little stage in this hall, and, uh, and it's, 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 it's worth a look at. And then in the 80s, then that closed, then in the 80s, the Assemblies of God, Pentecostal Church, used to just use, have this section. That's all was available. Downstairs was for something else. And then in the 90s, the uh, church called King's Church had this hall, just as upstairs, and uh, downstairs was something else. And then, after a little bit of a gap, we took, a, we took it over. And, um, and there began to be a sense of uh, solidity, a sense of we have our own space. A sense of we're, we're building something here, we're establishing something, we're getting established, and we could move out from here and, and do things. But it wasn't long before we needed more space. And so I approached the owner and said, um, I won't go into it in long details because it's a bit funny and, it, it, and I don't have time. But we, 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 and I said to him, I said, how about you shifting your business out from downstairs and we lease the whole building and you go and rent a shop down the road. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Because your, you know, your business is getting smaller because it was in DVDs, wasn't it? And, uh, no, no, not DVDs. <laughs> videotapes. Videotapes. <laughs> and then he went on to DVD. But uh, this was a time when he was in videotapes. I was speaking to him. So, so I said, videotapes are going, you know, whatever, etc. You know, it's, it's your history. So move out. Anyway, anyway uh, this was done over a meal. And, uh, you know... I smoothed away, and, um, and, and he said, you know what, I think you're right, and so we did a deal, and we took over the whole building, we took a lease on the whole building, and uh, we renovated downstairs, 
And if you remember, there was an apostolic ministry visiting one time, and they said, as you are knocking things around out downstairs, you will, you know, you will, it, it, it is like, uh, the, as you're knocking things down, there's going to be a breakout in the community. And, and fr- as we reshaped downstairs, we then, and that was done, we began to then do projects into the community. And, uh, and Legenda, a while ago, said to me, Charles, we have so many notices on a Sunday. Can we not cut down the notices? And, um, and so we had this debate about the best way to cut down notices and so on. And I don't think we agreed, but, um, but I heard her point. There were so many. But when I look back to what those notices consisted of, They consisted of numerous projects which we were doing into the community, where we were seeking to help our community with, um, from this building to, to ha- encourage hope and, and well-being, uh, you know, and so on. And that's why we had so many. Whether we had, you know, could have done them better, I don't know. That's, that's not really what I'm talking about. But, you know, in the sense of notifying people about it. But that's what was going on. There was a breakout into the community. And now we, after being here for so many years, having the whole building, and I was thinking about this the other day, I was looking at our notices sheet, and I'm thinking, we don't have many notices, Legenda. No. We have about three stable, no- you know, st- um, reoccurring notices every week, and then we add one or two maybe every other week or some extra. And I said, Lord, What about this re- reaching out to the community? God said, it's time for change, Charles. It's time for change. And you see, because uh, we have a heart for the community. We have a heart to be an encouragement to our community, to equip our community, to bless our community, uh, you know, etc. That is our heart. But if the people are willing and God is not stirring them up, to do activities into the community, God, it must be that God is saying, I don't want you to do that right now. Are you with me? And so I said, Lord, oh, so I said, I felt at peace about that. I thought, that's okay. That's fine. So what is it? What are we doing, Lord? And I felt, Lord, so you're building the house now. You're going to another stage of building, which if you were busy with loads of projects you wouldn't be able to do. And, but actually, you're going to another level because the building, of the, the, uh, building at this other level will enable you to do more within your community. It'll enable you to be more effective within your community. It'll enable you to have a far, far uh, bigger reach within your community. It'll enable you to spread out according further to another level according to the vision that I have given you and so we're at this place where now we are we are see, see in the in the place of um, battling with the administration not that it's hard work but it, for me it does because I, I, I'm impatient I, I like everything done yesterday I hate this administration all the rest of it but we're in the administrative <laughs> administ- we're busy seeking to purchase this house to not not just you know we're, we're wanting to leave the lease behind and purchase this building that's what we're seeking to do that's what we're involved in at this moment from an administrative point of view, purchasing this whole building. Okay? And this is so important for us to understand because all those groups that just had the top section of this building over the decades were groups that believed in the Word and the Holy Spirit. They were Pentecostal, charismatic groups. Okay, there is a well here and we have dug further than they because in this, and how do you mean, Charles? Well, the fact that we took on the whole building, all right, and now, 
And when we took on the whole building, people who used to be in the AOG, Pentecostal grooving that used to feel, got in touch and said, we hear that you've taken on the whole building. Praise God, that's what we pray, that the whole building would come into Christian hands. And so we're giving God praise right now. That's what they said. But we're going even further with this well. Not only having, moving from a lease to a purchase. To purchase. So that this land is God's land. Yeah. And for God's purposes, for God's glory, God's house set to remain. And so in doing that, that's just the beginning of the story because the next challenge that comes after that is the redevelopment of this building to make it fit for purpose for the near future and beyond. God is saying, we got it. He's doing it. And he wants us to co-labor with him. But God is also saying more than this. He's saying, I have stirred you up to do this. You see, but, but before we get on to God stirring you up and stirring me up, we need to understand this, that God has stirred up key people in this area, key people in this town, and will continue to stir people up so that we can do what God has called us to do. You see, God is into building, and, he, and, and, and because he's into building his house, building his church, building his people, everybody has to fall into line with that. It doesn't, you don't need to be saved. You don't need to know the scriptures. You don't need to have a godly inheritance. God is working out his purposes. And we as God's people have to be confident in that God is working out his purposes. And that God is fulfilling his vision. That he is placed upon our hearts. That he is doing it. And because he is doing it, then there is nothing too difficult for him to do. So bottom line is, finance is not an issue. Because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Our, if, you think, if we think we're poor, that is not an issue. Because all wealth comes from him. If we think we're persecuted and looked down upon and not liked and appreciated, so therefore people won't help us, that has got nothing to do with it whatsoever. Because God puts favor on whom he puts favor on. And also this we need to understand. That as we seek to build in the way and develop in the way that God has called us to do this house, that we will meet people who will come with their gifts, they'll come with their understanding, they'll come with their wisdom, they'll come with their insight, and they will say, how can we help? How can we help? And we must be wise and not be silly and actually say, well, you know, have you been through the partnership course? Have you, do, do you know the four spiritual laws? And uh, we don't want anything tainted. Get away. Is not God sovereign? Yes. Have we not looked at that for over a year? The sovereignty of God. He's in control. Everything good belongs to him. And he releases it the way he desires to release it. And he will use who he desires to use. He stirred Cyrus up. He stirred up somebody who was influential. He stirred up someone who could open doors. He stirred up someone who could make, uh, make a way where there seemed to be no way. He stirred Cyrus up. And I want to say to you that I think he stirred Cyrus up before he stirred up his own people. All right. God is going before, preparing the way. You see, somebody said faith is spelt 
R-I-S-K. It was John Wimber. Faith is spelt risk. From our perspective, our human perspective, it seems like uh, moving forward, doing what God has called us to do is risky. Say if we've got it wrong, all the rest of it, etc. Well, I want to say to you, God never gets it wrong. His word is his word. We get it wrong because we hear wrong. That's why we're told to weigh in things and test things. But can I give you some good news? If our heart is before God, then he will, he will overlook, he will overpower, he will, he will um, take our mishearing, weave it into his plan so that we get it right. Because why? He's sovereign. He's sovereign. And all he wants is us to fear him, tremble at his word, and to love him. He'll take care of the rest. So we need to trust him as we move forward. We need to trust him as we move forward. Well, the second thing I want to look at there is the stirring of the Israelites. Say that together. The stirring of the Israelites. Verses 5 to 7. Let's read together. After 3. 3. Then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them, helped them with vessels of silver and with gold, with goods, with beasts, with costly wares, uh, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. And so notice here that there rose upon the heads of the fathers houses of Judah and Benjamin, priests and Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house. So they heard the proclamation to go and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they had to be stirred by the Holy Spirit. They had to be stirred. And notice who he st- what is the sort of people that are stirred to begin with. It's the leaders. In other words, the influential people. Okay? The people that are li- other people listen to. The le- people that have influence. That's what leadership is, having influence. He stu- God stirs them up. God stirs them up. And God has called us as a people to have influence. You see, <laughs> we have influence in this community, right? We've served this community for years. People know us. Agencies know us. They might not agree with our theology, but they understand our heart. And, they have be- and people have benefited from the goodness of God in this house. That has given us influence. And if there are big things happening, I will get a call. We will be invited to things. Because we have influence. We have influence. And God stirred them up. Stirred them up. Just because you've got influence doesn't mean you, you, you're stirred up. Just because you've got, got influence doesn't mean that you're seeing clearly. Do, just because you've got influence doesn't mean that, that your eyes are open and that, and that you're ready for activity. God's activity in particular. You, will need, you need to be stirred up. What has all this teaching about faith been about for for over 12 months? It's God stirring us up. Stirring us up. Why has God been breaking into your life and touching you and bringing breakthrough here and there and healing and deliverance here and there, etc.? And you you can give testimonies of what God has been doing in your life. It isn't just about you, but it's about you building the house of the Lord. And the house of the Lord, you see, is, not, is more than bricks and mortar. It's lively stones coming together. This bricks and mortar is just a tool. 
But what gives this bricks and mortar meaning is us. Lively stones fitted together. Stones who are full of faith because God's, God has touched our lives and changed our lives. That's what it's about. You see, God has been stirring us up. And now we're at the place. And I remember in the meeting on Wednesday where we were talking about faith uh, in, as a subject in this season for the last time. And then somebody shared something which brought tears to people's eyes. And then I remember Pam saying, and now we activate faith. That's all she said. Now we activate faith. Suddenly, all the teaching that we've had on faith suddenly, suddenly had a, a something to focus on. And we thought, this is what we've been prepared for. And now I want to say to you that all that teaching that we've had on faith is now focused. This is what it's about. It's about building this house. Building it. Purchasing it. And developing it. So that we could go to the next level of service in our communities. And so... So here we are. So these people, they come. These influential people. Now you need to understand the power of this stirring. Because what is God asking them to do? He's asking them to go back to it, Judah. To a place where their houses were burned. Their vineyards were burned. It's 70 years on. So a lot of some, quite a few of these people will have never been there. Actually, probably more than 70 years on, actually. 70 years on. They hadn't been there. They'd be established in the empire. Got children, got grandchildren, got homes, got businesses. Probably people of influence. Developed their synagogue, their little chapel if you like, to worship God. Worked hard. And suddenly they've been told to go to a broken land, a barren land, a seemingly land that looked cursed, that no one had any interest in, and to build the house of the Lord. Years ago, people within, leaders within the charismatic movement said you don't want to go to Cornwall because it's the spiritual graveyard of the nation. You don't go there. Everything stops at Exeter. Don't go down there. It's going to be the death of your ministry. It doesn't work there. But how many of you know that God loves to do the impossible? How many of you know that God is interested in what we're not interested in? How many of you know God has faith for that which we do not have faith in? How many of you know that God is into the miraculous? And the miraculous only breaks through when, when, not, when nothing can be done in the natural. It is in God's agenda throughout this county to build his house, to build his church. To make his church glorious. To make his church wonderful. To make his church a place which is sought after in Cornwall. And over the years, I'm seeing strong churches being established in North Cornwall. Strong churches established in the middle of Cornwall. Strong churches being established right down here. It's tremendous. And there's such unity that I've never known in my 30 plus years of being here. God is building his church. I know, oh, yes, there's been lots of casualties. There's been lots of upset and pain as there is in a battle. It's not easy. Marriages have been lost. Ministries have been lost. Children have been lost. Homes have been lost. Faith has been lost. But God's church is growing. And it's stronger than it, than it was in my day down here. I'm not talking about just Shekinah. I'm talking about the church in this area. There was a time when there was only two churches that were Word of the Spirit Church, at Word and Spirit Churches in, in, in Penzance. And then there was a time there was one. And now there's three. That's growth. That's growth. God bringing in 
people who believe in the scriptures and believe in the Holy Spirit and having great influence in how things are done in this area. That's God doing it. Yeah. That's God. Yeah. And so what we see, we see, we, we see, and so, but they're stirred up, you see, they're stirred up, they're stirred up. And so they think, right, okay, I could, I, I'm letting go of all of this to grab hold of that. I'm letting go of all of this. Say that with me. I'm letting go of all of this to grab hold of that. One more time. I'm letting go of all of this to grab hold of that. I'm letting go of stability to take hold of instability. (laughs) But they were stirred up, you see. And when God has stirred you up, you only see what can be, not what isn't. You only see what can be. And so God is stirring them up and they said, okay, we're leaving all this stuff behind and we're willing to go. But folks, not everybody was because not everybody went. Some could, would not respond to the stirring of the Spirit and so they stayed in the empire and continued to live as they had been living and having, and, and having the quality of life that they were having there. And, so, and they stayed there and therefore weren't a part of the history of the reestablishment of the house of God in Jerusalem. And in that sense, they missed out on the blessing of it. Where are you? Where are you? Hey? Are you going to respond to the stirring of the Holy Spirit? Because to build this house and to develop it and so it can be what it's supposed to be so we can serve this area. It's going to need us moving in faith. It's going to need, need us operating in sacrifice. It's going to need us, mean us giving time and energy and finance into the redevelopment of this building, the purchasing of this place. Now listen to me. Notice from our scripture that the, that the resources didn't just come from the people But God touched other people to help them. And you say, Charles, we need help. Yes, we do. But we're only going where God told us to go. We're only doing what God told us to do. And he is our Ebenezer. He is our Ezer. He is our helper. And whatever we need to do what he's called us to do, he supplies. Because if he gives vision... He gives provision. All right. Job 27, verses 16 and 17. Let's read these together. Though he heap up silver like dust and pile up clothing like clay, he may pile it up, but the righteous will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. All the goods of the world belong to God. And although people who don't know God will, 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 will heap it up and, 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 and will hoard it and so on, when God stirs them up, <laughs> it comes to the righteous. It comes to God's people for God's purposes to do what God says needs to be done. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 26 ready for the to the one who pleases him God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God this also is vanity and a striving after a win. Vanity is striving after a win. People who are sinners who are busy um, you know hoarding, pulling things together, uh, g- gathering, collecting, but they're going to end up giving it to the one who pleases God. That's God's people. That's God's people. That's God's people. Because God's purposes must prevail. And Proverbs 13, verse 22. Let's read together. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. There are more sinners in the world than people who love Jesus. Am I right? 
There are more unsaved in the world than people who love Jesus. Am I right? And all that they have belongs to, the, to those who love Jesus. Because all good things come from God. All right? And they're for his purposes. And so I sense as we enter into this new season that what God is saying to us is, I'm building, will you be my co-laborer? He's saying, I've got this. I will resource you. I'll give you all you need. You will have favour. I will expand you. I will do all that I have to do in you and through you so that a house is built because I am building the house. Will you co-labor with me? You see, building is the Lord's business, you see. I hate it when I hear church leaders say, I'm, I'm building God's church. I hate it. I don't see that in Scripture. Jesus said, I will build my church. I will extend my kingdom. Come and join me. Come and be a co-laborer with me. I invite you, Chris, into the adventure. Come be my, by my side. This is my work, and I'm sharing it with you. And I love that. Oh, the pressure lifts. A man, you don't know how much pressure it is sometimes leading church. The pressure lifts. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you do, let me do what I'm supposed to do. If you abide in me, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're not going before God. God has gone before us. Everything is set in place. We just need to recognize the stirring of the Holy Spirit and respond. Building is Lord's business. He invites us to co-labor and he's always goes before us.